I banged on about the arrogance of trying to make your stag night unique. But of course, this pales into insignificance in comparison to the lengths people go to to persuade you that no one before them has ever really got married. In the old days, neither weddings nor the forerunners of stag nights were expected to be unique. In fact, the opposite. They were codified and set. Everyone who knew one another got married in due season at the same church, or at least one of the same four churches in the area, and beforehand every groom got drunk with his friends in one of the same eight pubs. There was nothing special about the special day, in the sense of different from all the other special days, and that was quite right. It's supposed to be special for you, not special for everyone who attends. How could it possibly be? In some of the summers of your late 20s and early 30s, you go to weddings more weekends than you don't. Having a wedding in it practically guarantees the unspecialness of a day. You're more likely to reminisce, do you remember Saturday the 12th of July 2006? No. Yes, you do. It was the weekend after Nick and Helen's wedding and before Jim and Rachel's wedding, when we had a bit of a lie-in and read the papers. Oh yes, that was a magical day. The problem is that these days couples more often than not pay for and therefore design their own celebrations. And this is bound to lead to trouble because as with the stag night, they begin to see it as a test of their originality and by association a yardstick for the depth of their love. This has got to the point where couples write their own vows. Marriage is becoming an umbrella term for a wide range of random and mawkish undertakings which men and women now choose to make to each other in the presence of catering. Whereas what it should be, and in fact is, however novel the usher's buttonholes, is a collection of people gathered together to make a deeply improbable promise that little bit more likely to stick. Up until a couple of decades ago, of course, the bride's parents had to organise it. They paid for it, they chose the nature of the do, and if the happy couple themselves hated it, so what? Give it 20 years and they'd have their chance to have a wedding exactly the way they wanted when they got to impose their tastes on their own daughter. Of course, the recent switch has created a cursed generation. They had their own wedding, spoilt by the generation above, but largely aren't allowed to ruin those of the generation below. Still, they're basically the same guys who stiffed us on pension, so sod them. The beauty of the old system, though, is that no one judged the couple for the wedding. It was understood that the blame for it rested with the bride's mother's terrible taste and her father's short arms and long pockets. It said nothing about the couple themselves or about how unique and special either their day or their relationship was. Indeed, they were expected to clear off from the reception as soon as possible, allowing the guests to do so also. Whereas now, having paid through the nose for a huge party with all their friends, and having long since exhausted the novelty of sex with one another, they tend to hang on till the bitter end, and do their best to make sure you do too. I suppose what I'm saying is this. In the very old days, you used to be told whom you had to marry, and that was a bad thing. Now, you not only get to decide that for yourself, but you also get to pick your own do, and that's also bad. I, I won't say worse, but I will think it quite loudly. You ought to have free reign to pick your partner, but the do should be entirely out of your hands. Which is, of course, still, as it has always been, the case for almost all grooms. The power of do organising has simply passed from their parents-in-law to their fiancé, not for a moment settling upon them in its flight.